Okay, listen, why don't we get started? Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Wilkins. I'm the director of the program of the legal profession. This is our weekly or almost weekly speaker series in which we bring in some of the most interesting people from really around the world uh, who are either engaged in the practice of law in various ways or engaged in the study of the practice of law. And our goal really is to create a dialogue between those of you who are studying law here at Harvard or otherwise connected with the community here and some of the best thinking about what's going on. And we are particularly honored uh, today to have uh, Colin Owang here with us today. He's the senior vice president and US general counsel for National Grid, which is one of, or perhaps the largest uh, utility uh, company in the United States. Uh, but he's also got a fascinating background, which maybe he'll tell you a little bit about, which I think is unusual for becoming a general counsel. He was, uh, before joining National Grid, an assistant US attorney here in Boston. Uh, has also worked as a special assistant to the attorney general and a trial uh, attorney at uh, environmental crimes of the Justice Department. So he's had a very interesting uh, career in the public and private space, and he's going to talk to you about that and about the, the fascinating complexities of his new job. So thank you. Hi. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if I stand up here, it's okay, right? The yeah. video is going to be fine. So I, I'm going to try to keep this relatively short on my end, mainly because I, I looked at the program or the speaker series that you guys have, which is an impressive array of speakers that you have. Um, I know what I'm going to say, so that's not particularly interesting to me. I don't know what you're going to ask about or what you're going to want to talk about. So that's going to be kind of more interesting to me and hopefully more productive for everybody. Um, a brief bit about what I do currently and then the things that I've done since law school to the extent that'll help you form your questions. So currently I am, uh, uh, as, as David said, I work at National Grid and I'm the general counsel there. So National Grid, as a publicly traded company, is actually traded on the London Stock Exchange, which makes us a FTSE 20 company. So the Financial Times Stock Exchange, one of the 20 largest companies is listed there. We are the largest utility in the UK and one of the largest in the US. In the US, we have about 7 million customers that take gas, natural gas or electric service from us. There may be customers in the room. I'm a customer, for instance. Uh, thank you very much. Please send it. <laughs> <coughs> Your checks are paying for my kids' college tuition, so thanks very much. The, um, and in the UK, we, are, we occupy two roles. We not only deliver natural gas and have high voltage transmission lines on the electric side, we are also something called the system operator. So in the US, there's actually a separate not-for-profit entity called the Independent System Operator, a little-known entity that sits out in Holyoke, Massachusetts for New England. They are actually the people that manage the physical movement of the electrons across all, this, all of the physical systems that we own part, NU slash NSTAR owns part. All of those systems are now kind of amalgamated at one level, and that entity, ISO, is rec regulated at the FERC level. Um, so National Grid, we have 17,000 employees in the U.S. Uh, we have about uh, $5 billion last year of operating profit, about $50 billion of operating revenue, and invested about $75 billion in the combined U.S. and U.K. infrastructure system. So as you can see, this is an industry that is a natural monopoly, right? It's capital intensive, high barriers to entry. The kind of thing that law school classes and seminars ought to be made about, but there's probably not here, nor was there when I was in law school, any class on utility regulation. There's increasingly classes on energy policy. So you don't have to know anything about that. In fact, it's probably more interesting if you don't know anything about that to work at the company or hear what somebody at the company has to do. So my job as general counsel basically is trying to map together three key audiences, three key stakeholders, and make the world a better place for all of them. And those Stakeholders are customer, customers, uh, regulators, and shareholders. Right? So that's not particularly novel for a heavily regulated industry, whether it's the utility world, telecom, cable, financial services. That's a pretty common equation. You know, how it works for us is a little bit different, both because of who we are, at, but also because of the way the world is changing. So from a customer standpoint, we all know as customers, that you know, working with a utility isn't always the most uh, exciting customer experience, right? So for instance, you want to buy a pair of shoes, what do you do? You go online, you probably go to Zappos, you see what you want, you look at other reviews, you have these great photos, you can rotate the shoe, 
and really get a sense of what you're buying. And then you can actually buy what you want. They will take your money, and everyone goes away happy. All right, so what's the experience when you come to National Grid? You just moved into an apartment, probably, or you want to just even worse, you're going to sublet an apartment, either as the landlord or the tenant. And you just want to put the service in the right name so you don't have to worry about the bill. And about you know, 10 years later, after you've pledged your firstborn and their firstborn's firstborn, you might maybe get that to happen for you, right? So, so why is that, right? I don't defend that, obviously. I make light of it. Why is that? Well, first of all, we're heavily regulated. And I cannot overemphasize how pervasive regulation is when you're in a company like ours. So everything we do, every penny we collect, that has to go through a regulator at the state level, sometimes at the federal level. And understanding how I can do what I need to do for my customers, but in a way that meets those regulatory requirements, right? that's two of the three audiences I just mentioned. And then I have to do it in a way that actually makes money for the investors. right? So that's the third audience. And ordinarily, those, those audiences don't see the world the same way. Because the customer wants what I just described. The regulator wants what to satisfy you as not as a customer, as a voter. Right? Because the regulators are ordinarily appointed by someone who is elected by you and who you will probably hold accountable, but only in that election cycle. So that's ordinarily a four-year window in which that regulator has to prove him or herself to you so that you remember the governor that appointed him or her ordinarily. Four years to show something of value to you as a voter so you vote for them again in a system where engineers are used to planning by the generation. Right? So we put up a pole, string a piece of wire, we use a 30 to 50 year asset life over which we depreciate that. So what we're designing, what we have historically designed is a system for the ages that now needs to perform in a world where you will make a purchase decision in a split second because of a bad Yelp review or because you're just frustrated with the website at that point and you can get it someplace else for maybe it's five bucks more, but what do you care? That's a different world, right? So your expectations are now based upon that customer experience in the world broadly not realizing that our technology is still the same technology that builds your grandfather's Oldsmobile, right? The wires are still steel, the poles are still wood, the pipes in, in, that deliver natural gas, they're now plastic in most cases, but in this part of the country, actually, there's a lot of cast iron and bare, bare steels, really, really old stuff. And there's no technological breakthrough, right? We haven't gone from wired phones to wireless phones until we can figure out how to transmit electricity and natural gas wirelessly we're probably going to be in this real conundrum, which is we have a regulatory obligation to provide everybody the same safe, reliable service. We cannot discriminate. And in the regulatory world, not discriminating isn't what it means in the legal world. It means giving everybody the same thing. We have a shareholder obligation, obviously, to make, make sure our shareholders get the return that they've expected. And most of our shareholders, most people who invest in utility companies are you know, twice my age. They have worked very, very hard their lives put their money under the mattress, and the only thing is that they're comfortable not putting it under the mattress, they'll put in a company like ours because they expect an annual dividend, right? which means steady, constant growth at a very, very low risk to no risk environment. And I have to make sure the regulators can tell you as voters that they're holding us accountable. So that's kind of what my job is, to connect those three audiences through the 200 or so people that have the displeasure of working in my department and making sure that it works for everybody there. So that's very quickly what I do. So you know, how, what have I done to get here? Well, it's not really clear, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a sense. I came out of law school, uh, not, not this fine law school, another law school. And I did what most people said. You should clerk. I had a great experience clerking. I was actually able to clerk for, for three federal judges only because I got lucky. right? So I had the chief judge on the Eastern District of Michigan in Detroit happened to have a clerk going on maternity leave for a few months at the same time that I needed a few months work to hang around in Ann Arbor because they have a program there where you can graduate early. And my girlfriend at the time was hanging around, so I needed to meet. So I got lucky. A loyal African-American chief judge of the Eastern District called Doris McCree, uh, a judge's former wife, who was running our career services and says, what can you do for me? And it'd be great if the person was a diverse person. So I got really, really lucky. Clerking for him, I got lucky again. Right? He said, you know, you should see, meet this guy, the US attorney, who I didn't know what that meant at the time, this guy named Saul Green. 
And Saul was the United States Attorney at that time, which is you know, no big, no, no little thing. Right? He's personally appointed by the President of the United States. That's kind of a big deal to me at the time. And he said, well, you should clerk. And when you come back to Boston, you should look up this guy. Let me give you his card, this guy that worked at a company called Ninex at the time. Well, that was the phone company. That, that guy was Wayne Budd. That guy is still Wayne Budd, who at the time was kind of the dean and now is kind of the gray eminence of the bar of color here in Boston. And they said, you should apply for other clerkships. I applied for other clerkships. I got lucky. There were two senior judges, Judge Garrity, who desegregated the schools in Boston, and Judge Skinner uh, of a civil action fame or infamy, right? Who, uh, who was the judge vilified by John Lithgow in a movie where John Travolta plays Jan Schlickman, the lead plaintiff's lawyer. And uh, they were both senior, kind of World War II era people who wanted to safeguard the government's money. So they said, well, we, we can't use a full clerk, but we'll offer you to work for both of us at half time. Well, so that was my first lesson in how to serve two masters. I didn't realize it at the time. But when you have two federal judges of senior status, one from each side of the aisle, as it turned out, one Democrat, one Republican. And they know they're sharing you. They don't actually remember that from a day-to-day -day basis, right? So, and you can't really say no judge. I'm sorry, because his honor has asked for something else, right? So that was actually a great opportunity. One sat only taking trial-ready civil cases, Judge Garrity, who's one of several uh, Democrats at the time of senior status who refused to hear criminal cases based upon principled objections to the United States sentencing guidelines. So we only took trial level civil cases in a, in a year. We tried probably six cases, which is a lot for a federal district judge. Right? So, and he had this great thing. And at the time, there was a case dropped, brought by Julian McLaughlin, who was actually an Irish American daughter of a lawyer who didn't get into Boston Latin School. She argued because she was not a minority. In that case, was being heard by Judge Garrity because they decided it was a related case to his desegregation of the schools 30 years earlier. Um, so that was fascinating. And then Judge Skinner only did two things. He only took mediation cases at the federal level. So now a lot of federal district courts have either a mandatory or optional mediation program. So if you have a federal civil litigation pending in a federal court, they will offer, offer, uh, offer you the opportunity or strongly encourage you the opportunity to have your dispute mediated by, in this case, a senior federal judge. And the art of mediation is very, very different than the art of litigation. Uh, and he also sat by designation on the First Circuit. So he also sat on the Court of Appeals. So I had an appellate clerkship, a mediation clerkship, and a trial clerkship all in one year. And that was, that was great for all those reasons. That caused me to move my focus from what I thought I wanted to be a transactional lawyer to be a litigator. So I did what everybody does. I went to a firm to pay off some loans. And I realized at, at that point, uh, the partners that I thought had the most interesting practices were all former assistant US attorneys. And at that point, uh, our US attorney in Boston, a guy named Don Stern, who's still an uh, active practitioner, no longer the US attorney, he sort of had an unwritten rule. You had to have five years of big firm experience before he'd even, before he'd even thinking about you. And among my limited virtues, patience is not among them. And I didn't want to wait five years at the firm. I'd paid down my loans in about two. So I was lucky. I was doing some environmental work at that point, some white collar work. A job opens up at DOJ's environmental crime section. Right, That's kind of perfect. And um, Again, got lucky there. And uh, did a detail to the US Attorney's Office in DC, which is like a big city DA's office, right? Because the District of Columbia is like a colony of the United States of America, for lack of a better term, right? They, don't, they have like almost no money. There is a mayor. There is a office of corporate, corporation counsel that does very, very minor speeding inf infringements and the like. But everything else, any kind of crime that you commit in the district is actually a federal crime. But in that office, you can actually be a federal prosecutor and do things like solicitation of prostitution, which I did, possession of marijuana, small amounts, particularly on the parkway, which is a federally regulated area. And you learn really about the messy business of the criminal justice system. You deal with actual beat cops day in and day out, people who are on the streets who do what they feel like the job requires them to do, and you're left with your professional and ethical responsibilities to guys, mostly, but also women that you see day in and day out that expect you to cook what they've caught, so to speak. And then you go back to main justice, and you there learn how to prep a case, because those cases don't go to trial quite as often. Um, and then I came up to the US Attorney's Office in Boston, and I got lucky again. Right, So um, six months into being in the US Attorney's Office, I get handed the duty pager, which is this pager that goes around the office in case anyone gets arrested overnight. 
And it goes off. Somebody's landed the plane in Boston. This guy's claiming he's Al Qaeda trained and he's claiming he has bombs in his shoes. And sure enough, he's Al Qaeda trained and he has bombs in each shoe. And I was just supposed to make sure the, the, the guy got detained, right? You would think. Even a junior prosecutor makes sure a guy with bombs in his shoes on an international flight can get the guy detained. It's not so clear. It was a highly political environment. And I got to stay with that case. I got very, that was, uh, again, phenomenal career experience. And then after that, we were ready to take Stephen Flemmy to trial, right? Whitey Bulger's right hand. And, um, and we got him ready for trial. And by that point, life was too exciting. So I came to the utility company. <laughs> So that's my background in a nutshell. But you see, through that, what I didn't realize I was learning was, you know, when you, whatever practice area you choose, there's that inevitable stage in your career where you have to prove yourself. And in fact, that never stops, right? You actually just have to prove yourself at different levels. But when you first start, you need to sweat the details and become a master of whatever it is you're becoming a master of. And then from that, you go beyond your job to do whatever you want to do. So that's more than my 10 or 15 minutes. So I'll just kind of pause there. I've shared a lot about what I did in back, my background, in case you have particular questions. But I'd really be interested in hearing anything you have to ask about, talk about, wonder about, because it's helpful to me, too, uh, in doing what I do day in and day out. The floor is open. I'll ask the first question, and then I'll let okay. it go. So, so I'd like you to talk a little bit more about uh, what you started talking about, which is being a general counsel in a fully regulated industry. And I wonder what that means for your job every day. And maybe you could just say a few things about, you know, how big the legal department is. <coughs> You've got this complex structure, right? So you're related to a, a yeah. global company. So what's that relationship? But then also, kind of how you spend your day-to-day -day time. Because I think a lot of things that the students are interested in is, what is this job? Sure. And particularly, how is it different if you're in a kind of a regulated sure. industry like you are? Um, happy to do that. So um, I, have, I have a dual reporting line. On the legal side, I report up to our group general counsel who sits in London. So she is the GC of the group of the publicly traded entity. So she, all the kinds of things around securities listing, securities disclosures, and a profession unto itself in, in the UK called the company secretariat is hers. And those are, those are the people that make sure all the governance is right. And in, in the UK, they're actually ahead of us by, by a fair deal. They're, they're very, very rigorous. You know, before Sarbanes-Oxley and before Dodd-Frank, the UK had its own versions, to which, which make Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank look like nothing. So there's very, very rigorous governance requirements. The board level. Who can sit on the board? How many women should there be on the board? The board committee structures, what do those structures do? How many directors are independent, not independent? Right? So that actually takes a lot of time for her and to me to support just making sure that members of the board understand their obligations and are fulfilling them and are executing them. Within the US, the, on the legal side, there's about 100 people in the legal department, of which about 65 are lawyers. The rest are a combination of people who do ethics and compliance, uh, records management. And then there's just a very, very small number of people who do some support staff for the lawyers. Of those lawyers, literally about half of them do our core regulatory work, our utility regulatory work. And the other half are a mix of litigators, corporate transactional people, commercial transactional people, real property, and environmental lawyers. And at that level, at the frontline lawyer level, there's, there's a mix. There are actually, since I've been there, we have hired some younger lawyers, meaning closer to coming out of law school. Partly because we had done a restructuring, and I took a lot more work back in-house, which is a trend I think you're seeing generally now in the profession. Because candidly, our fully loaded cost internally is about half the cost of our average outside hourly fee. Not surprising either, right? Now, I don't actually need or want, usually, the same sort of person that the law firms are hiring. I don't need or want the same sort of person the law firms are hiring. Right? I need, ordinarily, people who are very, very pragmatic. If they've worked for a living beforehand, that's usually a plus in my book. And I didn't. I didn't put my way through school. Right? I, I was very lucky uh, to have parents who were able to take care of that for me. But come the summers, I was definitely making sure that I was doing what I needed to do. That message was driven home to me. right? And I find that's very, very helpful experience. So we, we do, I do hire interns and externs from other schools that have formal or informal programs, because I have a lot of respect for that. 
I find that I can get people who have more varied life experiences. And those more varied life experiences may be closer to my customer experiences or my shareholder experiences or just experiences that I think will be very helpful in adding to the solutions that we need to come up with for a very you know, regulated business. And at every step of the way, we always need to know every decision I make, the time I spend, I have to keep a timesheet. Not because for company purposes, because my time is then allocated back to each one of our regulated operating companies. My expenses are allocated back. The kind of car I drive is public record, right? So that's not something everybody wants. But if you come from a background of public service, it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing. But literally everything like that has to be ready and open, totally transparent to the regulator. Um, and so that, you know, I think attracts a certain kind of person. Over the years, utilities have been very stable places to work. For a while, in the 2000-ish time frame, that meant it was very unattractive to people coming out of law school and coming out of the workforce then. That's shifted, as I think you know, right? People are very attracted to very stable places now for a lot of good reasons. And so we have that on the one hand. But on the other hand, we, we push our people. I will push my people you know, very hard to understand that learning and development is a lifelong process, right? Just because they've done it successfully now for 10 or 15 or 20 years doesn't mean that that's going to be the way to do it successfully for the next 5 or 10 or 15 months even. So that combination of having people who are very experienced, very hands-on, very pragmatic, yet also have a very you know, high level of eagerness and desire to learn and do things differently, that's a rare combination. Um, but I find that you can either teach it uh, or acquire it. So that's a quick answer, hopefully. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, I was just going to ask, uh, do you, how would you contrast um, uh, your general counsel's office compared to other like companies? So being yeah. in a public check, like I found it, you know, you said your your background is different than other GCs that, that end up at other companies. Is that on purpose? Um, in the sense of, yeah. are they trying to have a different? Uh, kind of culture within, or um, are, are you just trying to model basically on what any kind of company? I mean, so now the way I hire is very different from the way my predecessors hired and, or hired me. I mean, I think I was lucky in the sense that, you know, when they hired me here, uh, and actually in a lot of my opportunities, I've been lucky because someone's taken a risk on me. Right? There was no one at the company that had a background like me, uh, or actually that looked like me actually at the time. Right, so. I know I benefited from that. And that was partly because I had a GC then who hadn't done anything like I had done, but understood kind of the regulatory landscape and understood how someone who came out of the public sector would have a perspective that would be helpful at a company like the utility company. And that even though I hadn't done utility regulation, I had enough of a track record that had shown I could learn other things. I could probably figure this out. And most importantly, that you have more than one speed, right? You can't be a hardcore litigator that is only a take no, take no prisoners kind of litigator and then come to the regulators, the regulatory side, right? That doesn't work. Yeah. You have to have a bunch of gears. Exactly. Um, and so now I definitely am hiring a different profile. I think my predecessors were more on let's hire the best athlete and then we can train them to do whatever. And I think there's a lot of wisdom to that. But where I am now is, you know, the legal department, as I said, is just one department in this company. So my day-to-day -day basis, I spend in a lot of meetings, right? So if I spend, like this morning is our executive committee meeting. So again, that's roughly the top eight or nine in the US people running the entire US business. I am the only lawyer at that table. They don't care that I'm a lawyer until they need a lawyer, right? They want a business person, a colleague, a trusted advisor, a counselor, who may be trained as a lawyer or an accountant in the case of the CFO, right? Or a marketing person in the case of the chief marketing officer. We all have to understand the business equally. My biggest job there is actually to lead an organization which is not managing, right? which is not lawyering. It's leading. It's motivating hearts and minds to people that you don't see on a regular basis so they understand where the company is going and how they fit into it day in and day out. Which means that, yes, we are hiring very differently now. Right? I need people who are naturally curious and inquisitive, people who are eager to want to engage with other people. People are eager to expand their comfort zones constantly because the game is certainly changing on us faster than we're able to adapt to it. Please. Yeah. Um, what kind of core did you set out uh, to have for your career when you uh, just got out of law school? And also, uh, what influenced your decision to leave the US Attorney's Office? 
My goals coming out of law school uh, were to pay off my loans, first of all. That was, that was kind of the only goal I had, right? So that, that has a way of really driving clarity, right? And actually, um, my, again, my girlfriend at the time was in the same position. We both come back here, so we moved back here. We worked at different firms. We were able to do that. You know, we, that takes fair, more discipline than you might imagine, right? Because you know, when you come out of, of student poverty and suddenly you have actually a lot of money coming in, very hard to be really disciplined and sort of say, no, right? I'm only going to allow myself this little sliver of this massive salary that I'm making, knowing that you're probably not going to make that salary for many years. So that was easy. And then I actually came, before I went to law school, I came from grad school a little bit. And so I got derailed because my academic advisor there had passed away unexpectedly. So I always thought I'd be going back to academia at some point. But again, once you get out of school and then you suddenly realize you can make money or you can spend money and like opt to go back into grad school, which is, in my case, of comparative Chinese literature, you know, a 10-year road where if you get a job in Waco, you're lucky at the end of that, right? So I thought, mm, maybe not now. Right? That'll be there. So, um, and then literally, so I went to the firm that I thought I'd have a good fit at. It was, you know, just, you know, it was Foley Hoag in Boston. There's a lot of academic types there were at the time there. And I thought, all right, so I can be a little bit comfortable there. Um, and they had a good diversity of practice areas that I thought I would be interested in, and it just had a better fit. Um, and uh, like I said, it was really the cases I had the opportunity to work on. It was the, the, more, the partners that I was most impressed with, right? There were the partners that had grown up at the firm. There was, a, there was an office row that we would call Tweed Alley of partners that were bow ties and suspenders. Um, <laughs> And that's just who they were. And you know, their, their review of diversity was, we'll hire anybody as long as they're in a Harvard Law Review. And literally, they thought that was open-minded. Um, but it was, I got great training. I mean, I remember missing deposition training because I was actually taking depositions, right? And I just followed the mantra then, which is you know, try not to say no. Try to figure out, you know, keep your people radar on. Figure out who's who and, and what's what. And like I said, the people that I had the most respect for that I felt like I'd as a litigator, they tried cases and kind of knew what they were talking about. They were very pragmatic in their judgments. Um, we're all former federal prosecutors. So I said, all right, well, that's the card I need to punch. That's what I need to punch. And then what brought me out of the U.S. Attorney's Office, what, what brings a lot of us, is uh, have two kids, still two kids. And um, that was not going to pay the bills in the way that I wanted to pay the bills. I could have, at the time, there were a lot of people leaving the office in 04 to go to big firms to do white collar work that are now making lots and lots of money as white firm partners. Um, it's not what I wanted to do, it's just not my choice. And so I, I figured I would try this, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know that you talked before about how you have to balance sort of the interest of shareholders and of consumers and then of regulators. So, I'd like to hear some examples of when those interests are clashing severely and then how you respond and I guess who has to lose in those situations right. and how you make that decision. Yeah. Well, I always lose in those discussions, okay. right? Because I, I, I'm in the middle, um, so that'll always happen. So, so here's a good, a perfect example. Um, in order to earn a steady dividend on the shares, right, that means we have to have a certain level of constant growth in our business. And so that's not different from any other business, right? You always want some level of constant growth. We have limited ways where we can kind of earn those opportunities. So if you take our, our gas distribution business, right, so the pipes in the ground through which we're pumping natural gas, that is uh, historically seen as a growth opportunity because we have what are called leak prone pipe in the ground now, right? There's, they were designed back in the day like I said, they were either um, unprotected steel or cast iron. And they're very brittle. So in a climate like this, they'll crack in the winter. That causes leaks. You know, we can control that and manage that. Um, but it's not desirable. We can put plastic pipe in. Well, anytime we put infrastructure in, right, we get a return of the money we've invested and as well as on. So if I put in a plastic piece of pipe at 10 bucks, I get my 10 bucks back in the bills that you kindly pay in addition to my regulated return, which is usually something right now in say the five to nine percent range. So I'm gonna make you know ten bucks plus whatever five percent of that is, ten twenty, ten twenty-five, right? So that I can earn that. And that's how I pay my dividend to my shareholders. The regulator says, well, wait a second. If you're collecting ten dollars and that goes into the bill, that's now creating bill pressure, right? So the typical residential bill is whatever it is, say it's fifty bucks a month, and so now it's gonna be fifty, even if it's fifty-one. 
For a lot of us, we can handle that. Actually, for many people, they can't even handle the 50. And we're providing a service, right? It's not something that's optional. And that's why we have a regulatory obligation to provide it, safe and reliable service, the same kind of service to everybody who wants it. And we can't do that in that case, right? Because to upgrade the infrastructure will cause everybody's bills to go up, many of whom in neighborhoods in this city, for example, won't blink, some of whom now are going to fall behind on their bills. And when you fall behind on your bills, we have a regulatory obligation to actually shut you off. And we have regulators in some states that are very, very hard-nosed about that. Because if we don't shut you off and you don't pay your bill, that balance gets allocated to the rest of the, sh the customers who do pay their bills. Now, why is that? Why shouldn't we just have to eat it? Well, because, again, we're a publicly regulated monopoly. This is how it goes, right? So all that stuff you learn in your, there must be some law in economics classes here, I'm sure. Right, about we learn about free riders and social subsidies. Those exist for the benefit of a natural monopoly. Natural monopolies exist in this case because we're providing social services that are deemed you know, necessities. And that's essentially the regulatory compact. So what do we have to do? We have to say, all right, fine, we'll, create, we'll invest only at a certain rate. We'll only replace so much pipe every year. The upside is that moderates bill pressures. The downside is, from a safety perspective, we might actually want to invest more quickly, but we can't fund it. And the regulator says, well, if you, can, you might be able to find it. And we can, because we're such a big company. We, can, we have access to really, really cheap debt. So we can raise money at very, very low rates. Um, but again, only up to a limit. Even a company of our size does have a limit. So those are the sort of tensions. That's one, one example. Yes, those are great questions. I mean, actually, we're, we're grappling as a company and grappling as an industry with some of those very questions. So, so what's going to happen? Now, I see the, the, the consumer drive towards eye preferences, right? Phones, pods, devices, right? Is going to be the same for the grid, right? Everybody, we're already seeing that. So, you know, take natural gas, for instance. There are some very, very affluent communities in, this, in, in our service territory, right? Where people are willing to pay the extra ten or twenty thousand dollars, ten or twenty thousand dollars out of their own pocket, to get a gas main down their street, so they can have natural gas in their homes. They want that. They see the environment, environmental benefits in that, and they can run their AC and their heating, and they can control it all remotely. And so, in their twenty-bedroom summer home that they're in one week a month, they're happy to spend that money, right? Most neighborhoods in this city, even that one's not going to fly, right? We're not allowed to do that. So. The fundamental equation of how to deliver tailored customer commodities and goods in a world that's regulated that says you have to all deliver everybody the same thing, where the physical infrastructure has to be the same, that's a challenge. The smart grids will pop up in areas where I think there's new build or rebuilds. So for example, in our service territory in upstate New York, there is something called Luther Forest, which is a high-tech development park. So we had a bunch of customers come in and say, look, we need hyper-reliability for the following reasons. We're willing to pay our share of that, but we want you to build it. Here's the kind of brownfield that we're going to develop it in. So we're, now we're in there for the first time, and we can lay the infrastructure for a today customer today. So we can do it that different. And so then you have a place where you have a microgrid right, that is connected to the broader grid on days when they need the reliability and the service from the grid, and they can disconnect on days when prices demand them to disconnect. So for example, in New England, the peak days are still in the summer. Everybody's got their AC on, the hottest day in August, the middle of the day. This building may go to, to kind of a brownout phase voluntarily, right? Well, those people now can just disconnect and say, fine, I'm not going to pay your utility rates anymore, because now in the future, what we'll do is we'll jack prices up during that time where we don't want people on. They'll be able to self-supply. They'll have solar panels on their roofs. They'll have wind, you know, wind turbines in their backyards. Or in the case of the non-environmentalists, they'll have a diesel generator where they've hedged the fuel price on diesel three years in advance and can arbitrage the difference. And they'll just blow black smoke out the backyard because it's cheaper for them to do that. But we have to be able to accommodate. Now, that's a very different grid. That's a grid that flows two ways. right? That's not just a one-directional flow. That's a grid that still needs to be paid for by everybody who uses it in a proportionate way. Right? That's the turnpike. Right? You use it, you pay for it. You don't use part of it, you only pay for part of it. You don't use it, you don't pay for it. 
But right now what we're having is, you know, we have a social policy in Massachusetts, for instance, where, we, where the administration has been great about encouraging renewables and solars. And this, this cropping up of solar fields in this state in particular has been encouraged by policies that says, look, you guys can do that. You'll get an incentive return. You get a tax discount, and that's great. And you don't actually need to pay for the grid now. Well, that part has to stop because we're paying for them to be able to use it. And that's okay, right? You can have that. That's an incentive. It's an appropriate policy incentive. That's what the government decides to do to encourage investment. But now we're at a point where it's not going to be sustainable. <clears throat> so we've got that seed money started. We've got the policy started. But we need to be able to invest in our system. They have to pay for what they use, essentially. That's the American way. Yeah, that's Awesome. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I wonder where um, climate change fits into your practice from a disclosure perspective and a compliance perspective. And you mentioned as an advisor uh, in the, uh, with regard to, say, risk management from a business perspective. Yeah. That's changed a lot, actually, just in the, in the years that I've been at the company. But in the last five years, you know, again, driven by mainly UK requirements, there, there have been a lot of... Um, advisory disclosure suggestions that are increasingly taking on a, a more mandatory flavor, but aren't quite yet mandatory. So we had been at a point as a business where we were setting carbon budgets for us as a business, and we were reporting on those carbon budgets by way of voluntary disclosure uh, because we wanted to reduce our own carbon footprint as a company. But again, that's been you know, mainly voluntary. We've shifted off that a little bit because the UK regulatory environment has shifted a little bit. But we are involved in other projects. For example, in, in, um, in the city of New York, we've just built a biogas, a very big biogas plant, that will burn and then refine um, the vapor effluent from a combined sewage outflow treatment center, reprocess it, and then inject it back into the natural gas system. And so we'll be able to sell that. That's been largely because the mayor uh, wanted that to happen. Mayor Bloomberg wanted that to happen. It's not necessarily economic, but we've, we've done it. And in the future now, the industry is debating with Congress, so to speak, whether or not there will be these mandatory dis disclosure requirements. The focus right now as an industry isn't so much on, um, is more around things like the extent to which we participate in shale gas procurement or production, obviously, or um, in some cases, if there are certain minerals in some of the infrastructure that, that we install. Again, largely geared at the transparency around mining conditions since that had been somewhat of a, a salient topic. But that's the, that's the only extent to which I see it playing right now. I suspect, like every other topic, there's going to be more scrutiny and transparency, not less over time. And do you get involved? I see your hand up. But just do you get involved in, the, in that meeting you had this morning? You know, are you talking about these kind of high-level policy issues? How are we going to kind of anticipate? We all know that there's a lot of discussion around whether it's global warming or, yeah. or mineral mine, heavy metals or, I mean, you ticked off like five things. How do you, you know, do you, are you involved in those kind of forward-looking discussions? I think some yeah. might be interested. Yeah, I mean, I think every one of those things comes up in a variety of ways. It either comes to our executive committee discussion or it'll come to our policy committee discussion. We had a debate about what's, what's the company's view on shale gas. Now, the, the time it takes a utility company to debate something can be quite time consuming. So actually, we were already delivering shale gas at the time we were debating our policy. So that kind of really mooted that point. So it was really around, like, what do you do as an industry? This is a classic example of, as a regulated in industry, right, being able to read the, the winds, the political winds, or the regulatory winds. Being able to say, that's a great idea, let us give you some ideas on it. Trying to influence a train that has or is leaving or very clearly going to leave the station is a much more effective strategy over the short and long term than trying to jump in front of that train. Right? And, and there will be times to try to jump in front of the train when you think that's a possibility. But in many of these things, again, you know, we are essentially married to our regulators. So any case or proceeding that we feel like we've won today, it's going to be those same people back at us tomorrow that are going to remember how we treated them, how we litigated in that proceeding, and how the media portrayed that denouement that we're going to have to live with. It is not in our best interest, right? So every one of those topics that will come up, and that is kind of one of my jobs, is to understand and really impress upon the combined organization 
the impact our regulators can have when they you know, haven't been happy with how we've behaved. Yes, please. Good. Uh, two related questions that follow from where you just left off. Uh, when you have these interactions with regulators, do you have the sense that they have the, the technical and uh, business background to understand your company and, and what it does uh, and what its needs are? Uh, so that's one question. The other question is, I'm, I'm wondering if the pervasive regulation, if, if from your vantage point, if it's a help or a hindrance. Um, so if you woke up tomorrow in FERC and its state counterparts were just gone, uh, would National Grid be more profitable and more efficient or less? Great yeah, those are very good questions. I mean, I think on the first one, you know, regulators are people too, right? So like any public, <laughs> uh, any agency, right, there's a variety, there's a great diversity of abilities and talents. Um, and then you have the public sector kind of disintermediation phenomenon where uh, it's harder to work in the public sector. You really have to be devoted to what you do or you have to have other incentives that make it rational for you to stay there, right? Whether it's a, whether it's a pension, whether it's because it's easier, whether it's because it's easier, um, you know, those are a variety of things. But for the most part, you know, at the, at the senior level, at the appointed level on the senior staff, they are absolutely people who know what they're talking about and have done it for a very, very long time. Like with any job, and this was true of even my, my dear friends in the U.S. Attorney's Office, we all have a shelf life, right? And if, if you're not constantly open to understanding the pros and cons of how you've done your job, you may not always be open to the pros and cons to how you could do your job. And that's always a frustration. That's a frustration for people at, you know, at the company or, or at, at the regulator. So the regulatory construct is not one that is the most favorable environment for innovation. Right? You, you don't hear of startups being born in the regulatory compact. Right? That's not the way the world works, and there's a reason for that. So that's a challenge. Trying to innovate within that structure is, is a huge challenge. Increasingly, the regulators are more and more attuned to that, particularly as the people who are elected that appoint most of those regulators have been clearer in the expectations. But even then, it's down to the human level. So the, you know, the commissioners themselves on the utility commissioners are imported by the governor. But then once they're appointed, they serve a term. So they get some level of immunity. And then the people on their staffs, like any government agency, they're usually career people. So some of the senior managers may be appointed by political fiat. But most of the more junior people who actually do most of the work that matters are career people. So it's very hard to influence people to do something differently, right? So this skill of influencing without authority, uh, which you can learn across the river at the business school, which you never teach in law school, is a key skill, I think, in, in any lawyer doing being something effective. Now, today, I do think the world is better off with a regulatory structure of some sort over an industry like ours, right? I mean, whether it's us, railroads, airlines, uh, phone service, right? There are certain reasons that the regulatory compact exists. There are certain reasons that I think monopoly theory exists. And I think for the most part, that broad stroke of structure still makes sense for us. I would like it to, see, to move from a regime that's backward looking, which it is currently for the most part. They do prudence reviews or hindsight reviews. So they'll say, over the last five years, based on the hindsight of 2020, is every dollar you spent, is that prudently spent? Now, it's supposed to be with the hindsight of what you knew at the time. But the way you know, it's articulated in theory and the way it's applied in practice isn't always the same thing. In the UK, it's a much more forward-looking, as is true at FERC, too. Well, they'll say, for instance, over the next five years, we will allow you to collect X amount of dollars in your rates from customers. And you can spend that revenue in the way you see fit to maintain your license. That gives us, as a company, the ability to say, great, now we understand what our revenue is going to be, so we can deliver to our shareholders the kind of return ex expectations. At the same time, we can plan year on year how to cycle that money and budget it with the flexibility, knowing that it's assured. You know, in the US right now, every dollar we spend is still subject to the possibility that someone may, the regulator may say, you didn't spend that prudently, in which case we're going to disallow cost recovery. So that's, you know, that's a hit to the bottom line. That's a hard place to be, right? It's not going. It's not environment that's going to encourage even like the slightest bit of risk, and that's a problem. Right? That's you want some risk if you want innovation. Question: It seems like most general counsel stay general counsel, and they go to a different company or retire. But since your background is so varied, I'm just wondering: Is there anything else that you would want to do besides being chief? Yeah, I, every day I try to stop being my, stop doing my current job. <laughs> I, I kind of joked that um, 
because I don't want to be, I mean, in my industry, I am you know, quite actually very young. Um, but you can always become a blocker, knowingly or unknowingly, right? So I don't want to block the development of any of my team. And I always want the opportunity to continue to learn and grow. Otherwise, it, it gets boring. Um, so I have looked at other things like uh, education, for instance, because, I, like I said, I came from an academic family. I am an academic. I had looked at it at one point in my career and going to you know, the meat market out of which all great law professors come. If you really want to feel bad about yourself for a weekend, you go to the, just go to the meat market for the heck of it. Um, nothing can take your ego down like going to that place. Nick, Nick is, but, but oh, yeah. Nick is going to be fantastic. <laughs> sure, sure you will. If you survive, you may be one. Um, yeah, because I think about you know, other industries and other businesses. And for me, like I said, doing my job is really about being a, a business leader as much as about being a general counsel. So it really does matter to me. Like, I don't think I'd really enjoy being in a retail environment. Uh, just because, again, that's a personal choice. It's not a judgment. It's just not what I would think would enjoy. So this is, works out quite well for me. I've thought about going back into the government for the right, you know, the right time. I've thought about going to a different industry in a different level of role. But what I found is, um, they don't always tell you this, but what I found is no one really wants a, someone who was a GC, because then if you go into, say, a deputy role, and that GC is always worried about whether you're, you're in, in for their job. And they just, they just ordinarily can't get comfortable with that. Um, so um, and at the, you know, at the same time, then I've got just the requirements of making sure I, I can still send my kids to college and things like that. So crossing over to the business side? Do you want I did cross. Side, as we sometimes yeah, say, I did go to the business think side. About being a business leader, either at National Grid or another organization. At one point in my career, they did move me over to the business side. I did actually customer strategy. I had, I had no background in customer strategy. Again, I had a chief customer officer that thought I, I should do that for a little while, and that was actually a very good experience. I helped uh, lead the merger integration when we when we doubled our size. So back in '07, we bought a company called Keyspan, and that doubled our size here. And I worked on the integration team. So that was very much a project management business role. There was no luring whatsoever. But you get to see every aspect of the business then. So that's usually beneficial. Um, and yeah, so I would go to the right business function. And in fact, when they expanded my role, when I started as GC, I was just GC over the legal department that I described now. I have another 100 people or so that do the regulation side, all non-lawyers, that do the number side of rate design, economic forecasts. When we raise debt, they make sure they go out and look at the treasury yield curves. And that's, again, I don't have a finance background. That's stuff I've kind of had to learn on the job. And you empower your people to do all that stuff. And that was seen as an expansion of my responsibilities to give me a kind of a P&L impact, because that's essentially the cash register for the company. So you know, that's, that's been good, too, my opportunity to learn. Um, there's a bunch more headaches, too, that come along with it. But to me, I can probably get straight with many, many opportunities, as long as you can continue to learn, as long as there's some component of public service to it. For me, that's, that's been what's important. Please. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I, Congratulations. <laughs> I came here because I'm interested in, in energy and climate change and things like that. So I go to the Foley Hall Act meetings. Oh, yeah. Day. The round tables. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really interesting. And there's one this Friday if you're interested in that Friday right morning on, on gas, actually. One of the things that I know is, is around the world, the, the utility, the idea of the utility is changing very rapidly. For instance, uh, RWE, the second largest utility in Germany, it, it seems to be changing their whole business structure to become a renewables funder. Yeah. Um, you have a backlash against uh, renewable portfolio standards in some of the states like Arizona here in the United States. You have ISO New England saying by 2020 we want to get rid of all of the real uh, oil and coal fire. Right power plants, which the environmental community doesn't seem to understand is already happening. So that it's a very fluid future, it looks like, for the utility and, and the structures. You also have National Grid in Connecticut going through 300-year disasters. Northeast right, utilities, different yeah, companies, yeah. yeah. But we had an equivalent up here. As right, well, yeah. and, and, and you have Connecticut now saying, well, we want to figure out how to do microgrids, how to regulate microgrids on a statewide basis, what are the standards? How do you see all these things? Because these yeah. are coming at you hot and heavy, all yes. these changes. Yeah. I mean, these are all perfect examples of opportunities that we need to 
influence, right? These are not going to stop. There is a part of the company, I think, that for a while was just said or saying, this, you don't understand, you people who want these things, why that can't work. And that's not going to be a successful strategy for us. Any of these ideas that take off in the near term, when I say near term, we're probably at least 10 years, are going to still require some amount of a utility grid, right? Nobody, with rare exception, can go fully off the grid on their own. There are those places, and that's OK. But if they're ever going to need the, the grid, even an hour a year, then we're still the best position to do that. So we're going to still have a very similar business model, where that backbone infrastructure is infrastructure that I still think is best suited to a natural monopoly to be able to deliver. But not in the same old way it always has been. Right? It has to be more flexible. And it may be that it's a little more disposable, right? So maybe we're not looking at 30 to 50 year depreciation asset lives anymore. Maybe we're looking to 5 to 10. There's a different level of resiliency and reliability. And again, people only remember that when they get their bill and they say, great, it's lower. And then when the lights go out, they don't remember that what they paid for is what they got. So that's a very, very tough you know, spot to be in. But there's so many stakeholders in this process getting that whole regulatory stakeholder group to move along in the same direction at the same time, that's the hugest challenge, particularly where people want different things. So we can do smart grids in some places. I think that's quite possible. You know, we can do renewables in other places. Again, Cape Wind wouldn't have happened if Senator Kennedy were still in office. But that was, you know, times changed when that happened, and we helped enable that. These are choices that, you know, we have a limited amount of degree. At the end of the day, we're happy to try to facilitate them. I think that requires greater flexibility on our part. But our, under our underlying business model still remain, remains largely the same, meaning our investor base is still largely the same. And if we're overnight going to change our business risk profile, then the investment community is going to change. And the risk reward proposition is going to change, which means that the regulated return that we're going to allow, that we're going to be allowed to earn, has to reflect the risk that we're taking on. Right, because that's how the way it works. We can't just take on more risk at the same old low return. And all of those dynamics make for very complicated and long discussion. But that's a glimpse into what we're trying to do. Which I think is why you can't get away with saying you have a boring job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, and from these, I have to say these were fantastic questions. I always am amazed at the, the terrific questions. I hope you No, it's been it great. Well. I love it too. But I mean, it really does show all the things that are going on. And you're kind of in the middle of all of them. I mean, helping to try to understand the legal side, the policy side, the business side. Exactly. You know, I think that is why for the students in the room, why we think we ought to be paying more attention to these roles, because I think they are roles that are in the middle of policy making, both policy making internally for the company. You haven't even probably talked about the 25,000 ways you're thinking about what compliance exactly. means or FCPA or setting internal norms, how many employees there right. are that you run a kind of microcosm of a legal system inside for those people. Then you've got all the interface with the actual regulators and the government officials. The terrific question was asked before about that. But then you have all these issues floating out there that other, you know, what are other people doing? What's best practice? Where's the future going? How to think about that? I, you know, so I don't know. Sounds like an exciting job to me. <laughs> so. We can trade for a day. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I'd be confident, but we'd love to have you on the academic side if you're serious. But for now, let's have, other people can talk informally, but please thank yeah. Alex. For <laughs>